my name is Thomas Kvarnström and I'm, uh, I'm one of the product managers for the application runtime group in Red Hat. And with me today is Jason Green. Jason, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. So I'm, I'm Jason Green. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Corcus project, and, uh, but I'm previously most known for the uh, Wildfly project and DevOps EAP. Cool. So today we're going to talk about Quarkus. And Quarkus is a Kubernetes native Java stack tailored for Graal VM, OpenJDK hotspot, and it's crafted from the best of breed Java libraries and standards. And don't worry if you didn't understand that. We're going to go through where, a bit more what that means and what the value of, of Quarkus is. But before that, we wanted to start. Let me change the slides here. Uh, we wanted to start by introducing what, what the problem is that, that Quarkus are looking to solve. So uh, Quarkus is looking at evolving Java for serverless and container workloads. So uh, one of the problems, for example, is that not only Java, but a lot of the Java enterprise application has originally been designed for a three-tier type of application. And we, we, we're used to deploying them on one single operating system, and they'll, they'll take over basically all the memory of the machine, and they will run, and they'll perform excellent, but, but they're, built, they're based and built out of this architecture that's it's been around for a long time. Uh, actually, what also happened in a lot of cases is that, that people actually deployed multiple applications on top of one application server, and that application server was then uh, uh, hosted on a single operating system. Uh, so, but since then, the world has evolved a bit, and what we're seeing right now is microservices uh, type of architecture, where we now kind of deploy multiple instances of all of these, and then potentially having them uh, orchestrated on a container platform like Kubernetes. And and we also uh, also what happened is that the architecture has changed so that each each uh, Active platform like Eclipse Vertex, or in in Spring Boot, etc., uh, uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We could actually mix and match between those different technologies, but but that's that, but one of the problems we should say here is that that Java has always suffered from this fact that it's been been designed from the beginning to be uh, be. Uh, it's basically a, a server-side job application, writing and, and taking up a lot of resources and using, utilizing full, the full resources of the platform. And there, there has been some improvements on that, but when you put Java in a container, it, it still has uh, some of those limitations in there. There's a great blog, by the way, on the Reddit developers blog, so later on you might want to check that out. That explains uh, one of the problems with running Java in a container, for example. So, so one of the problems and one of the complaints that we've been seeing is that oh, Java is is a bit uh, fat. It's overweight, and uh, and it, it, it so it takes. So, for example, in in a in a container orchestration cluster, you, in a single node, for example, you might only be able to fit like four Java processes uh, or containers. Well, if you're using Node.js, you could fit more and and go even more. So. Uh, so that's uh, that's obviously something that's that's not good for Java. So um, and moving that to the next step, where we're talking about function as a service or, or serverless architecture, that is just going to increase. We're going to in increase the number of deployments we have, and they can have. And actually, there will be potentially hundreds of nodes, and we don't know where the nodes are located. They can be geographically dist distributed, etc. And and all these services, small services, core screen services, are running over in that. And obviously, today what we see, and, and what we see is that the serverless adoption around Java is not very high. It's about 6.1%. Uh, so we can see that that languages like Node or Python or even Go surpasses Java uh, in here. And 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 one of the reasons that Java is still a valuable valuable thing here, you actually see that if you look at this particular um, this particular report from serverless.com. 
Uh, we actually see that bigger companies, like 1,500 employees, etc., the Java uh, numbers goes up. Uh, and one of the reasons is that Java still has a very, very good and vibrant ecosystem around it. So developers feel comfortable. There's a lot of frameworks to work with, etc. And there's just so much trust in Java as well. Uh, that leads us to the introduction to what Quarkus is and what 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 we mean with Kubernetes Java here as well. So uh, first, let's start with the name. What what is a Quarkus basically? Well, well, quark is any number of subatomic particles carrying fractional electric charges, and us in terms of us as developers. It's the hardest problems to solve in software because collaboration is harder than anything else in software. Uh, so what does Quarkus bring to us? What's the benefits? So the, the first benefit we would say is actually developer joy. Uh, building and developing on Quarkus is, is fun and it's, it's extremely easy. And, and it has things like library loading, making it extremely easy to get it up and running. And, and any change you do immediately reflected, and you can, you can see that in the blink of an eye, the change is going into that. We also mentioned in the beginning that it's based on the standards, but it's not limited to standards. And that means that we a lot of the, the frameworks and third-party libraries that, that uh, developers love to use uh, are still out there and then are, are supported in Quarkus. I mean, you can use them in Quarkus. But we're not gonna lim at this point. We're not gonna limit us to 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 satisfy on certain standards. We we are all about innovating at this point. That's an important uh, distinction. Uh, Quarkus has unified configuration and and it streamlines the code for 80% of the common use cases, and it's all still flexible for the rest of the 20% of the use cases. So, uh, and the last thing is an important thing, and we'll get into what we mean when we say native later on, but no, we say no, uh, no hassle native executable generation. So uh, one of the things, and I, can, we can, I think we better cover that already, is one of the things that, that Quarkus can do is also it can take your Java application and render and, and build a native build applications uh, of that particular application. And the native applications and those does not require a GVM to run on it, like traditional Java applications does. So it can run standalone. Uh, it, it requires uh, uh, basically two libraries, but then can run standalone on any uh, on the operating system that is uh, currently supported, which is Mac and Linux. Uh, Windows should come in a, rather soon, I think. But uh, so. What do, we, what do we mean when we say supersonic and subatomic? Well, here is some internal testing that we've been doing, some data from some internal testing we've been doing. So comparing three different type of applications here. So I mentioned that you can generate a, 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 a native uh, application from Quarkus. So that's what's called the, Graal, the Quarkus plus Graal VM here in this, in this particular picture. We also have Quarkus plus OpenGDK, meaning you run a Quarkus application on a GVM. And then we have like a traditional cloud native uh, stack that would you would use your traditional frameworks, etc., uh, to run on. And if you compare these different use cases, we have one first use case here is a REST application. It's a simple REST application. Uh, the second one is a bit more complex. It's a REST application calling to a database using the Java persistent API, returning the uh, the Java objects, and then uh, transforming that into JSON and and returning it to the client. So if you compare these, you can see that we we have in startup time we have even a more than 100 times faster startup times uh, when we're running in native modes. So the startup time for the REST example here, as you can see, is 14 milliseconds, and the startup time for for Quarkus plus uh, Graal, for the REST plus GPA application is 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 55 milliseconds. So there's there's it's extremely quick to get started and it will almost immediately, we'll show that later on in the demo, almost immediately be able to serve requests. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, so that's that's perfect. Another good thing with the native application is that it, it only takes about 10% of the memory compared to the, to the traditional cloud native Java stack. Um, it's it's also faster and and also more memory lenient if you're actually deciding to use it on a GVM as well, which is also a perfectly valid uh, valid thing to do. It, it's about 10, 10 times faster uh, than uh, than um, than a, a typical application, but it's uh, 
and it's only using approximately half the memory here. So, um, and the third benefit here that I'm going to highlight is that we, we are actually, from a Java perspective, uh, uh, what's one thing I mentioned before, reactive platforms like Vertex, etc. So the Vertex team has been heavily involved in, in, in developing Quarkus as well. And what we've been able to do is to unify the, the, the traditional imperative development mode of Java and, and in most programming language together with the reactive mode. So basically within the same applications, you can have both of these, uh, these REST endpoints where one is, is serving you a text, text plane saying hello, uh, and the other one is serving you server events from a Kafka stream, for example. And, and, uh, and, all you, have, and you, can, you can always, uh, so to get access to the, the reactive part, you can just inject uh, what's called an event bus or the vertex context itself. And you can develop uh, vert, uh, applications, if you're familiar with Reactive, you can develop applications uh, almost the same way you've been doing on Vertex. Uh, so that makes it enable to use what technology that fits your use case. Uh, because from my, uh, from my perspective, I, I'm, I'm a product manager for Vertex as well. And, and Vertex is a fantastic product, uh, but it, has, uh, it is kind of hard to, to take uh, developers that have been developing Imperative for many, many years and move them over to a reactive mode. And to be able to mix and match that makes it much more easier and available for them to actually use something like in a reactive uh, code for certain use cases. So that can, and particular use cases where we, where we would have perform much better in an async context, for example. And uh, there's more to come uh, in the next couple of months around uh, the imperative and reactive mode as well, I should say. Uh, so with that, I want to switch to a demo. So I'm uh, I'm gonna go on the wild side here. I'm gonna uh, start with a uh, very simplistic demo from the command line Im immediately, and I'm actually gonna start from an empty demo here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start and generate a new product, and in Corcus, that is as easy as uh, as actually executing the Maven plugin with a, a task called create. When you do that, you get a couple of questions. Uh, so which kind of group ID you want to use, the artifact ID, the version number, and then you ask if you want to create a REST resource from the beginning. So let's do that. And what the REST resource name would be and, and which, res which resource path it should respond to. So let's, let's do it, that. So now we have an application and I can open the application in a code editor like, like Visual Studio Code, for example, or in CellEJ. We support uh, any uh, any IDE that that basically support that understands Java or Gradle and uh, Maven or Gradle and Java, I should say. So let's open this particular general uh, applications that we we built here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to put the command line in the, in my, my and I actually should probably do all, do that again. Let's try this again. I did put an extra code in there and uh, let's start dotting there. Let's do this again. So I'm going to use, just for the case of this DMR, I'm going to use Visual Studio Code Editor. You, as I mentioned, use the, the one you prefer. So now uh, you can see that I have my, my Java application uh, configured. I have a POM file with some basic settings around some basic uh, dependencies that we need to do the REST application that I asked them I asked you to generate. And I got this hello resource defined here. So one of the things I can do, which is pretty nice, is that I can I can quickly start this application. So I'm going to open an, an, an uh, terminal in my editor, actually. And I'm going to do run maven, compile, and I'm going to Quarkus colon dev. And Quarkus colon dev is the, is, is, is the library load. So this will actually start my application. And, and my application is now started and listening on port 8080. Uh, if I go here, you can see uh, it should listen, to, respond to the path hello here. So let's try that out. So I'm going to use, let's do this. You can see this. I'm going to do, I'm going to use HTTP pi as it's called. And I'm going to call 8080 slash hello. When I do that, I get a response back saying, hello, that, that was easy. But what if I want to change that? Well, let's change it to something else. Hello too here. 
and let's let's save that file also that's important so you can see that, uh, that whenever i have this this uh, dot up here it's not saved so i'll save that file and then i hit the same endpoint and immediately the changes are reflected so that that's pretty nice but what about doing something more uh, advanced let's let, let's say we actually uh, introduce the the message we want to send as a, as a configuration message instead so i'm going to do something like this and i'm going to do um, Bonjour, and uh, I'm going to save that file and I'm going to go back to my hello resource and now I'm going to say let's inject uh, well actually we can do it afterwards uh, configuration property that has the name demo message and we'll store that in a string old message now what i can do is i can return like this let's say message and it will return a message for me uh, so let's check and see if we can get get bonjour or if we get hello we get bonjour now so that's pretty impressive uh, and pretty pretty nice so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to extend this even more i'm going to try to do a uh, more advanced example when i'm going to create a web socket to do that, I actually need to add a couple of more uh, uh, entries in here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stop my library load. I'm going to add a couple of dependencies in here. And again, the, the let's go to the direct, direct, uh, correct directory here. Again, the, the, the Quarkus plugin provides us with a good feature here. We can list the available extensions that is part of the Quarkus. And we can see we have a number of extensions here already, and this is growing all the time. But we, we're going to go in and we're going to add a couple of extensions here. I need, I need multiple extensions here. So I'm going to do Maven, uh, Quarkus, and I'm going to say add extension, and I'm going to say reactive stream scheduler. Yes, I need that. I'm actually going to use the vertex. Uh, to to get some reactive parts in here and i think i'm gonna need one more is it yes i'm, I'm gonna do the web sockets so i'm gonna add web sockets in here as well so let's execute that oh oh i misspelled web sockets so let's run it again with with sockets and and now we got WebSocket support in there as well. So with this, uh, I'm going to create a new class in here, and I'm going to call that uh, hello, a new file. I'm going to call that uh, WebSocket Java, and it's going to be running in package or Quarkus sample, and it's a public class. Or web sockets and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to annotate this as a server endpoint oh what I probably wonder if it hasn't reread my maven yet well here we go server endpoint and it's going to respond to slash vs and I'm also going to set an application scoped and annotation on this application itself from there, we're now ready to, to create a WebSocket application. So I'm going to copy and paste some code in here because it's boring to watch me type. But basically what, what this is, and let's see if I can organize the imports. Oh, wrong button. Uh, and we need to import a session here. It should be a WebSocket session. And I think we're done there. Yes. So what if, what we do here is we we when somebody connects to the web socket, we basically just add it to this vector. And if somebody closes, we're gonna remove it from this vector. And uh, when some when we want to broadcast a message, we can use this method that is gonna call a session and, and for each uh, for sessions and for each element in that vector, it's gonna get the, an async remote and send that particular message to the client. So that's that's pretty that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty simple stuff. But there is 
Uh, and what we can do here is we can actually, for example, do, let's do a scheduled task here, and we're going to do a, a public method, and we're going to call that method uh, tick, yes, and in tick we're going to say uh, every, oh sorry, I need to say here, every Two seconds. I'm gonna do broadcast just a server side event. So pretty simple. Uh, we save this, and I'm gonna go back to my opening my uh, my uh, online again and start my uh, my Quarkus Dev mode again. And now, if I connect to this and everything works, uh, I can connect to this using, for example, WebSocket should be. So we're gonna go connect like this. And I should be seeing a server side event every other second here being pushed from the client, from the server out to the client using WebSockets here. So that was pretty easy, but what if we want to do something more reactive? Let's say we're listening to stream of events coming from a message broker and we want to convert that a bit and then send it out to the client, maybe recalculate something, etc. Well, that's pretty simple as well. So let's let's actually remove this scheduler. And even if I save this, it, it's it's not well, it actually stopped. Uh, it, has, it hasn't stopped, but if I now run the WebSocket, it's it's not now not serving because I haven't scheduled anymore. So what I'm going to do here is uh, I'm going to inject what's called uh, what's called our event bus. So I'm going to go back up here and we're going to say in here we're going to say at inject and we're going to say event bus from the vertex for here. So now what I can do, let's organize the, oh, wrong problem again, and let's organize the, uh, the inputs. And now I'm gonna create a, a post constructor to this that actually co connects to that particular uh, event bus. And, and, uh, and it's gonna listen for a, a queue on that event bus called uh, VS clients. And then uh, as soon as it re receives a message, it's going to broadcast the message, uh, the body of the message to uh, to our uh, to our all our clients. So what we can do now, for example, is we can go back to our hello world and create a similar thing. I don't I don't have. A, uh, I'm going to just copy a couple of things over here. So we're going to have a simple date format. Uh, oh, always press the wrong button, don't I? Uh, there, and we're gonna inject the event bus. Oh, and here we're gonna do import the vertex core event bus. And then I'm gonna put the scheduler in here in this class just to show that it's a different class running here and then this scheduler um, we are uh, in this time we're, we're actually gonna use the same event bus named vs clients and we're gonna send service sent event and we say at and, and the actual date that we're gonna send that so I need to import the date uh, as well now we should be done so again I happen I, I accidentally closed my my um, my um, uh, I closed my um, terminal, so I have to restart the, the dev mode in here. Oh, I actually probably didn't close it. So let's see if it's still there. Yeah, we have a couple of processes still running. So let's just see. Here we go, let's close that and close that. So 
No, we should be fine. Try it again. So now we're up and running. So let's try this WebSocket again. And it doesn't send anything. So we need to investigate a bit. Oh, I haven't saved my POM file. That could be one thing. Oh, you know what? I forgot to import my post constructor. That's probably an issue as well. We'll save that and stop that and restart that. Oh, it's typical at the amount. Uh, so I probably made a mistake somewhere here and we're not gonna have time to look at it right now. But let's... Uh, Let's see if I can solve that later uh, when, when Jason talks and see what that. Basically, this would then send the messages that we'd get on the event bus and and return it to the to the to the client again. Just every every other second, we would return a message to the client. So with that, what I want to do now is I'm going to close the editor here and I'm going to go over to a pre-baked version of the same product that I have, um, and that pre-baked version is called. Um, Work is getting started for me. And in here, the difference that I have in here is that uh, my particular, uh, in this new, well, in this pre baked version of this, I've done a native compilation. I could do the native compilation when it takes about one to two minutes, and I don't want to sit and wait for one to two minutes. So I have the native application in here as well as Java application. So we could start the, the same application server. We could start by using Java minus your, the same application target, and then we'll do uh, my corpus project, runner.jar. And if I do that, it, it comes up and running in about 1.3 seconds, and it's up and running. And if I do, hit the correct key here, if I do web so cat here, uh, should be able to see server event sent message here. So every other second it sends a server sent message. So it works here. I can also do obviously the uh, HTTP to hello and we get bonjour here. So that was pretty fast. But actually, let's let's see what see what a native runner looks like. So I, as I mentioned again in the target directory, I have my version of the uh, this and th you notice that this one doesn't have a jar ending it's basically a binary the native applications so i'm running this outside the, uh, it, it, it doesn't run inside the gvm so i don't have to issue jar uh, java minus jar command so we'll start that and you potentially notice that it was very very quick and started in 19 milliseconds and let's test the same thing so i can do the hello i can do oh sorry <laughs> i did the wrong I can do the web so cat here and I get service sent event message and service sent messages. So and that's that's pretty pretty darn fast. 19 milliseconds and you're up and running with a full application like this and and, and doing pretty advanced stuff actually. So uh, with that I'm gonna conclude my demo and go back to the slides. So What's the value of this then? Well, why, why is this so important? Well, if you look at the container orchestration uh, application, that uh, a container orchestration, on, the on, on two nodes that are similarly sized, uh, where you would typically perhaps only run like four instances of a cloud native Java stack, with Quarkus, you can run the same application uh, and you'll fit uh, 10 times more, in this case, 40 instances on the same node. So that obviously it's is much better for scaling. So if you have different application or like a microservice where you have multiple different types of applications, we can have different types of applications deployed here. And depending on need, we can scale up automatically, scale up and scale down to meet the number of requests that, that is required. So if one of our services are running more heavily, more CPU bound, etc., something like that, we can automatically scale that up quicker it will start very quickly and you can scale that up and, and you have the 
opportunity to do that because you have much more space to do that in the node. Uh, and this will also, if you go to a public cloud provider, this will cost also save you money because you don't need the number of nodes, so many nodes anymore. So it will save you a lot of hosting costs in that. Uh, so with that, I'm going to leave it over to Jason to explain how this is possible. And, and, and I hope I've convinced you how good Quarkus is. And now Jason's going to tell you why that is. So take it away, Jason. Sure, thanks. Um, so one of the things uh, that I think is uh, worth thinking about is when you look at the way Java is today, which, um, which Thomas, you, you mentioned um, earlier in the slides, that uh, Java itself was really uh, designed around the notion of having this very dynamic uh, infrastructure and platform and was focused on optimizing heavily for throughput. Um, and usually the deployment model involved, you know, you would deploy to a, a physical server and um, it would consume the resources to provide that maximal um, throughput possible. So when you would look at things like language scores, Java always uh, does great. Um, and of course, another thing that developers really liked about Java was with the, the, uh, the dynamic capabilities of the platform um, where anything could change, um, you know, as far as like using reflection, uh, dynamic code loading, all that type of stuff. Uh, and, and using those capabilities, there's a rich, um, set of APIs that are out there so that can do almost anything. Um, and that pattern of, of rapid productivity um, and the ability to deploy new code was really important for Java um, in, in the past. But it, when we move to the container paradigm, we're looking at cases where uh, things, you know, the conditions have changed. And now, you know, the Kubernetes is really sort of the new modern application server. And containers are these, these immutable constructs and so you have all these capabilities in the base JVM which are not really getting used because when you go and you actually you, you start your, your your Java application all that work for self introspection and analysis and the ability to support loading the code all of that stuff is not really necessary because the end result is always going to be the same it's always going to be the exact same application um, being started so what we did is we took a look at uh, at evolving the architecture to be more in, in more in line with what is happening in from the Kubernetes point of view. So if you look at Java itself and think of things as, well, if I can prepare everything in advance, then I can have the same capabilities. I don't have to give up my APIs and the ecosystem that I love, and I can still get um, really nice performance, really nice footprint, um, scale up with density and so on. Um, so there's two models we have we, that was mentioned before. We have the native model, and then we have also running on, on OpenJDK as well. Uh, but the native model is certainly the thing that's the most interesting because it's, it's the newest aspect that you don't see uh, in other uh, Java frameworks and platforms. So if, if you look at, uh, if you go to the next um, next slide, that, that, that this is made possible was recently, uh, last year, uh, a, a new pro uh, project in the Java ecosystem, uh, GraalVM, was released. And this, this project is a, it's a fairly overloaded project and it provides a, a different set of capabilities. Um, it's essentially uh, has inside of it a, a VM that is designed for standalone executables, um, but it also has, a, has other capabilities as well. So if we, if we look into that a little bit further, um, if you go if, if, looking at the next slide, there's, a, um, there's a, a different set of pieces. So you have the notion of the polyglot capabilities with the truffle element. You have the notion of a, of a new compiler for translating Java bytecode into, into machine code, just-in-time machine code, the, the Graal compiler. And that's something that you may see other projects that talk about using Graal. They could be referring to different aspects, and it's not always clear, um, so you can kind of look at the details a little bit. But in the case of how we're using it, we're, the most, we're most interested in that, in that native runtime, um, which, which is internally called Substrate, um, although uh, in the community you'll see it referred to frequently as, as GraalVM um, native images. So the, the thing that's interesting about this technology is that it compiles the JDK and your actual uh, Java code into a native executable that um, only composes what the, act, it, it does things like closed world analysis to where it only contains the actual elements of your program that you're using. So if you think about things from the perspective of if when you're using a framework, how much framework does a typical, say, microservice application 
use, you know, it might use only say 10% of an API. So why store all the rest of everything? It's much nicer to be able to do uh, static uh, compilation. Um, however, the challenge is that this technology works and, and any kind of static compilation works only when you're able to reason about what is actually used in the application or not. So all these really fancy dynamic capabilities that have been in Java frameworks that allow you to do things like when you saw Thomas working in the demo, there's all these annotations around that, that have uh, inversion of controls. So there's um, decoupling between components. And typically that would be resolved later at runtime as to if I inject um, a, an object into another object, I, that's not, it's not clear which object is being injected when until at runtime based off of a set of rules that happens. Uh, so this isn't really useful for something that does static compilation. And so that makes using a technology like this very difficult for Java applications where essentially you have to give up on these rich programming models that developers have loved and used today. So uh, looking at the next slide, um, this is the key problem is that if you develop a Java application using this technology directly, it's a pretty painful experience. Um, so what Quarkus is really all about is essentially giving you the same exact experience that you would have in a dynamic Java uh, runtime environment but giving it, to, giving it in a way to you that you can use it in both in native executables and running on open JDK efficiently. And so to talk a little bit more about that, it's, it's useful to look at, at the actual process. So on the next slide, we, we're looking at the phases of how Quarkus works. Um, actually, can you skip to the next one? And we'll go back. Okay, so um, the, the actual process by which Quarkus works, what it's all about is shifting the work that a runtime environment would do at the start of your application into an earlier phase as part of compilation. So what Quarkus does is it takes your application and it determines all the frameworks that are currently being used and it augments them uh, via bytecode transformation, um, code analysis, and it converts and resolves things such as if I have, uh, if I'm using injection between two, two objects, it's able to resolve what that result would be and then change the code to produce something that is friendly to a static compiler. So instead of saying, you know, add inject foo, um, that gets changed into a direct, you know, set this object to be foo. Um, and then from that, we, what we end up with is we end up with all of this startup processing gone. And instead we end up with a optimized executable in the native fashion. And then on Java, when we're running a traditional JDK, we also get faster Java performance because there's less code being loaded and less code being um, executed. Another thing that we do in Quarkus is we, we actually persist the state of heap to have uh, really amazing startup times. So we, we take advantage of certain capabilities as part of native compilation, and we take tasks that normally would be performed when you're when your system starts, and then we actually build that, the in resulting memory state, so we capture the memory state. So, so frameworks that were, that were developed um, for a runtime model now can have the performance without a, a drastic amount of change to it um, in a native execution model. Um, so, of course, there's other optimizations we have to do. So if you could go back one slide, Thomas. Um, there's a set of things in order to function in this, envi in this environment that, that, so anything that uses introspection has to be handled in other ways. Anything which um, uses dependencies has to be rethought because when you run in, when you run in a, um, in a trim slimmed environment, the goal is to remove anything that you might use to determine what state would run um, from the process of what's actually being executed. Um, and then we also want to be very friendly for an ecosystem. So we have this notion of different levels of optimization. So you can have some frameworks that could get incorporated that are based up, uh, that are, that have very little change at all. And then in other cases, we would take frameworks that we, that we've worked on and really optimize them for this particular, uh, use case. So, and this kind of all builds up to the, the architecture we have. So if we, uh, skip to the architecture slide. Um, what we end up with is a set of extensions, which you saw when Thomas was using the, uh, the command line where you pick what extension you're using. So uh, each framework that gets integrated, you uh, use an extension for that. And then we have a base common core platform and a whole set of technologies that we've developed that are designed around uh, building these optimal images and optimal um, standalone Java jar assemblies. And so with this technology, our argument is, um, skipping ahead again to the next slide, is that using Quarkus that you can have a 
cloud native experience, which is optimal for both serverless and container environments. Um, and this really changes the way in which a developer interacts with Java. So you, you don't have to switch technologies to um, and, and, and start all over and, and do something completely different and lose the ecosystem that you have. You can carry that forward and still produce uh, really lightweight applications that are, that are high density. So with that, I'll hand it back to Thomas. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> so that was actually the last slide. So uh, uh, I want to thank you uh, for attending, but we're going to open up for questions right now. Uh, so I, I guess, Diane, will you monitoring and manage that? Yes, I definitely will. And while, while we're doing this, and, and if, could you pop over to the Quarkus IO GitHub page so that people can find out where they can find all of this and how to, um, yes. I think my, my one question is, where do they get all of this and how do they, start using it um, would be yes. my first That's first a good point. Then we can actually walk through a bit uh, quickly how to get started. So so Quarkus, there is a, there's a getting started guide, which is pretty simple, actually. All you need is a uh, job ID. You need a, a, a DDK, like Open DDK, uh, and you need Apache Maven or Gradle. Uh, and if you want to do the native compilation, you also need the Graal VM. But otherwise, you can run without the Graal VM. And then uh, there's, a, there's a guide where the steps that I did in the beginning on how to create an application is available, etc. There's also a bunch of different guides that explain different things in here and explains, for example, how you do things like like object relationship mapping, uh, how you do uh, talk to a, a, a cache like Infinispan, how using even transactions, etc. So there's, there's some pretty good um, guides in here and we're working on extending everything here. Uh, as, as quickly as we can, but there's there's a lot of a lot of things that we have to do for improving this. And we should mention that this is this is still an early version. We are on version 0.12.0, uh, but it's 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 pretty stable at this point. But uh, but we would not recommend putting it in production at this point. Uh, uh, we uh, we will uh, we will in a reasonable time release a a, 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 a 1.0 version of this. Uh, so that's that's how you get started. You should also mention that there are uh, Sulu groups uh, where you can get in contact with the developers if you have questions. And uh, there's also a, a guide on how to write extensions, etc. I'm talking about extensions and doing that. So um, with that, I'm going to open up for questions again now. Yeah, I think you've done a very good job um, of, of answering most of these. Um, the questions that I that I sort of have for any any new project too is you know how do people get feedback to you, um, and how to you know where can they contribute to your project and so maybe pop over to GitHub to the Quarkus IO repo um, and show them where they can log an issue or something that would be great um, and 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 what are what are some of the, your um, cadences for releases on this. Yeah, so I think Jason has responded to some of that in the chat. But yes, we have a GitHub project on github.com slash Quarkus.io. So feel free to open issues there if you have any uh, issues uh, running Quarkus. And like Jason mentioned, we're on a bi-weekly cadence, uh, not a strict one, but we try to release every every other week and uh, adding uh, more and more capabilities uh, and, and features to Quarkus. Jason, do you have anything else that you want to add to today's talk? Um, I really appreciate you guys coming. Um, this is, you know, it's all very new to me, and it's awesome to see um, Java go cloud native. So um, I'm really pleased, um, and, and welcome you guys to come back each time you have a new release um, and tell us a little bit more. Jason, if there's anything else you want to add? Sure. Yeah, I just want to say that um, we're definitely uh, looking for uh, feedback on, on your ex uh, experience. So if if you guys uh, try out the technology. Uh, and let us know what you think. We'd definitely love to hear that. Um, as, uh, you guys just talked about contributions, so uh, any sort of uh, community contribution, um, PRs, e filing issues, anything like that, uh, it's really helpful and really appreciated. Um, we, we, we view this as uh, a really uh, exciting opportunity to, um, to make uh, Java and Kubernetes work incredibly well together. Um, so um, 
your involvement in that community is is very much uh, a part of that. Will, it, will any of you folks be at the KubeCon EU coming up in um, Barcelona? No, I don't think so. Okay, well, we've yeah. got how we can get you um, some some time in front of that community and 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 do some publicity and advocacy there for this. That would be a great space. Absolutely, I totally agree. Let's let's think about that afterwards, Dan. I think that would be nice if we can get some people from Quark or somewhere. That would be great. Um, I think that you'd be surprised at how many people in the Kubernetes community are going to welcome this. So, um, great. That'd be a great space. That's coming up in May, right after Red Hat Summit. So, look forward to working with you guys and and hearing more about this as this uh, comes up. Uh, not seeing any other questions in the chat. So I'm going to let you go, and then if you can just send me the slides, I'll post this on our YouTube channel and on um, the blog um, that is under openshift.com uh, in the next couple of days. And um, we look forward to, again, hearing more from you soon. Thank you. Okay, goodbye.